Good morning, everyone. It's time to begin our service. Let's all stand. One of my um, favorite psalms is Psalm 63. And uh, David begins by saying, O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. For some of us, maybe 10 o'clock is early. For others, you know, it's another time. But really what I, what I feel David was saying there when he used the term early was, you know, first thing. I, I'm, I'm going to seek you because that is the, that's the earnest desire of my heart. I want to do that first. And then he said, my, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. And one of the translations I was reading, and I couldn't find which one it was this morning, but the, uh, the translator turned it and it made it a request. And in that David said, let me see you in the sanctuary. Let me see how mighty and glorious you really are. And then verse 3, because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. And really, I believe that every day of our life, that desire for God should be the thing that um, really um, characterizes our life that we want him more than anything else there's this desire for his presence and, and David had that desire and it manifested not only in the way he worshiped God but then how God used him to to lead Israel and so I, I just want us to have that same earnest desire in our heart every time we gather for worship to experience the presence of God. You know, to pray what David did. God, let me see you in the sanctuary. Let me see how mighty and glorious you really are. And so I, I want that to be the, the heart cry of our hearts this morning, that we want to see Jesus. We want to be able to experience him in a new and fresh way. We, we want to touch him. We want to see his face. We want uh, to experience him. And so let that be the 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 heart cry of our heart as we enter into worship this morning. So God, we are here in your midst today. And we don't want worship to ever become something that's just something that we do. That's part of the service and we do it because everybody else is doing it. But God, every time that we gather, we want worship to be and the outflow and the outcry of our heart. God, we want to see you. We want to experience you today. God, we want to bless you in this place. We want our lips to praise you. We want our, our, our mouths to glorify you. And God, we, as we lift you up and as we worship you, we, we want to experience you in a fresh and new way today. So Lord, let our hearts be like David's as we come into your presence today, God. I don't want, personally, I don't want this just to be another worship time, another song service, but God, I want this to be my heart crying out to you and saying, God, I want you, I love you, I need you, and I want to see you today. And so, God, I just pray for each one of us, Lord, whatever our week has been like in the past, this past week, that we can set those things aside and that we can focus upon you because it's you that we need to change any situations that's in our life. And God, plans for this afternoon, we just put those aside, Lord, and we focus our attention on you. We set our affection, we set our attention on you right now, and nothing else is going to rob us of what we want to do in your presence today. So we give this time to you, Jesus. Meet us here in this place. And God, when we meet you, we know we're being met by love because you love us. You want to fellowship with us. And you look forward to spending time with us even more than we do with you. And so we come to your presence this morning and we thank you for who you are and for your presence here this morning. If you're ready to worship, we all say...
hope was torn, you mend again. You redesign the tattered thread by hand. You take the broken and destroy and you rebuild. You
to be afraid of God's presence today. He's inviting us in to enjoy Him. We love you, Jesus.
hard sometimes right now to, when you look out at the way the world's going and the way um, the states are going right now, our nation, our nation is truly raging in many ways. And it's hard sometimes to think about how to pray. But see, this is called the Lord's Prayer. And actually, it's more appropriately titled the Disciples' Prayer because when the disciples asked the Lord, Jesus, how should we pray? This was what he told them to pray. So he told them to pray on earth as it is in heaven. And we all know that Jesus never asked us to do anything that wasn't possible through him. Okay? So he wouldn't have asked us to pray on earth as it is in heaven if it wasn't possible to have earth be like heaven. And that's actually our role as Christians and believers is to have to rule and have dominion over the earth. That was the first commandment that Adam was given. He was to rule and have dominion over the earth. So I just want to encourage you this week, um, sing this through your house, speak this over our nation. When you watch the news, don't watch the news. Turn the news off and pray this instead. Let's just go there, okay? Pray this out. Joyfully warfare over our nation. Joy fair, okay? Now I want you, I'm going to challenge you all. I'm going to challenge you all, and I know it's hard because we're wearing masks and we're, you know, it's hard. But I want you to sing this with everything that you have this morning. I want you to declare this over our nation this morning that the kingdom of heaven will be on earth. We are releasers of the kingdom of heaven on earth as those who are the bride of Christ, as those who are children and co-heirs with Jesus Christ. We're children of the Lord. I want you to release this over our nation. Release this over our government. Release this over the people. Release this over everyone that the kingdom is here that it will be on earth as it is in heaven, that the culture of heaven will be released in our nation, in Jesus' name. So Father God, we lift up our nation. I want you to lift your voices now, everybody. Let's just pray. We just declare, we just thank you, Father God, that the kingdom, the kingdom is released through us because we are one with Jesus Christ, the anointed one. He lives his life within us. He dispenses his life through us. We just declare it in Jesus' name that every place our foot treads is claimed for the Lord. We thank you, Father God. We thank you, Father God, that love conquers hate. We thank you, Father God, that love casts out fear. There is nothing that this world needs that isn't found in your love, God. So we just declare a tsunami, a tsunami, a tsunami of the kingdom of heaven washing across this nation and across the globe. We declare it in Jesus' name. We declare it in Jesus' name. And we pray. We pray on earth as it is in heaven. Now I want you to sing and sing with everything you have. And let's just declare that one more time over our nation.
God, just begin to declare God's kingdom. We declare that there's freedom in the capital of the United States of America. We declare, Lord Jesus Christ, that you are Lord of Lords, King of Kings. We thank you, Lord, for your angels sweeping across this nation now. Oh, we ask that you place link angels round about our nation. The warring angels over us driving back the forces of the enemy's camp. Lord, we speak peace, peace that passes understanding, peace that will rule and reign in the hearts and the lives of individuals as they come out and vote. Peace, we proclaim peace where they call for uh, destruction and things to take place in certain specific cities throughout our nation. We say you will dissipate in the name of Jesus Christ. And we speak peace. Supernatural peace will come in. And we take authority over those things that the enemy would mean for destruction. And we say, Lord God, turn it around. Do it again, Jesus. Do it again. We thank you for a supernatural election, Father God. Lord, we're not voting just for a man or a party. We're voting for life and life abundantly. We want the curse lifted off of our nation. Oh, Shire o rapota e vento shele avresi o ramore conare o if my people if my people will fall on their knees and pray if my people, if my people will look unto me and not away. If my people, if my people will know that I am their God. I will do things, I will do things that you will know. No other man, no other woman, no other child would be able to go. For I am your Lord. I am the King of Kings. And I have not changed. No, I have not changed. I have not changed. Now prove me herewith. Church, from this day forward till the election, I don't want you to look at the negative. I want you to pray in the spirit of the living God because our flesh can speak what we see with these natural eyes and we need not be doing that that's not health that's not life abundantly we want to speak life abundantly over our nation and we want we pray now Lord God that the hidden things come to light Lord that the king's heart is in your hand and Lord you watch over him and you turn it whithersoever you will and Lord we thank you that you can supernaturally move upon people and Lord we thank you that there will not be any destruction in the name of Jesus Lord we pray for a landslide a landslide so that there will be no nobody can murmur or complain and Lord we thank you for these hearings that have come through this week Lord we thank you Lord for being with Amy 
for blessing her and watching over her refresh her restore her strengthen her today as i'm sure she's in your house praying and believing lord for she stands for justice lord i thank you for watching over her and keeping her safe and her family and we seal this off with jesus precious name amen church you can be seated Sorry, I got a little political there. Not sorry. We're going to have to do it, church. Come on. Hidden things are coming to light. Just keep praying. Pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. Because you know and I know we all can go off on those rabbit trails of thoughts. That gets us nowhere. Just pray in the Spirit. Amen? And I don't know if you watched the confirmation hearings this week. That girl did good. I was proud of her. When, I was proud of our, uh, the people, the men that took up for her this time. They weren't going to let it be like it was the last time. And they still tried to twist and turn. There's a lot of evilness in the world. People aren't necessarily evil. You, you have to know they're being driven. And, and they all feel, you know, people feel they're going, doing what's right. That's what's great about the United States of America. You know, we can just have our freedom. But church, if we'll do our part and pray, God can work this thing out. Amen. We're so close. So close. So close. Just pray in the spirit. Amen. We were on vacation this week, and we kept up with watching what was going on, just so it helps you to know how to pray. Amen? Hallelujah. This is an important, important time in history. And God has placed each one of us here for such a time as this. I truly believe that. He could have put us throughout any other decade, any other century. And I used to joke and say, I thank God he put me in the century that had air conditioning and pain shots for childbirth and, all the, and a lot of medical stuff. Or I'd have been dead already in another century. So thank God for that. But now I'm thankful because this is such an important time in our history. It's awesome. Awesome. I don't know. Okay, sorry to switch gears like this on you, but um, if you're hungry, this is imperative. I need everybody that is staying for this, the Pastor's Appreciation Social to raise their hands so I can get a head count. Dave, can you help me? <laughs> you want to take that side and I'll take this side? And uh, so I just need a head count because i got to go order the food. <laughs> All right, there you go. Keep your hands up, please. Don't forget me and Dad. I want pizza. You know, um, let's see. Oh, I just, first of all, I wanted to say thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody who had a part in making our service so awesome last week. Pastor Mike and I were watching, and I was so proud of all of you. You know, uh, Jess did such a good job with the worship. Kathy did an excellent job just taking you all into prayer and, and sharing scriptures and all, and, and um uh, Katie did an awesome job with the word. It just was such a blessing. It takes a village, a church village, for he and I to be able to go on vacation a week. And I appreciate it so much. Thank you to Michael for staying. The most, one of the most important things, he stayed at our house with Bo. He just stretch your hands toward him, pray for him. Bro, Bo is getting more finicky in his old age. He's 14 and a half now, and... Every time he stays, there's something else that's going on there. So he knows his quirkiness. He can handle him, and Bo can't boss him around too much. So I just so appreciated that. It was such a blessing. So I just want to thank you all again. It was an awesome service. We watched it all, and, and we just were so blessed. And then we went over to see my mom and Roy, and we spent two days last week with them. They send their love, and I told them, you send your, your hugs and prayers for them. They're doing well. They're um, just getting a little older, slower, and, uh, but they're doing, they're doing well and happy and healthy and pretty much healthy, a little trouble walking. Other than that, 
God's good. Amen? Amen. Let's receive our tithes and offerings this morning. Thank you, Jesus. 1 Samuel 17, 46 and 47. This very day the Lord God is handing you over to me. The whole earth will know that there's an extraordinary God in Israel. And everyone gathered here will learn that God doesn't save by the means of sword or spear. The battle belongs to the Lord. That goes right along with what we were sharing now for our nation. Amen. And we are closer now with Israel because of our president than we have ever been before. What he has accomplished in while he's been in office, this is not to exalt him. This is God's anointing on him for such a time as this church. Ooh, got goosebumps on that one. He has been able to help fulfill prophecy. So continue to pray. But we can link up with this. Because we are friends with Israel. Amen? And Israel loves us, and we love Israel. Now our confession. I face giants in my life with confidence and faith, knowing that God has given me all the weapons and strength I need to face the giants of fear, worry, and vain imaginations. I step out boldly trusting the battle is God's and he will bring victory. I step up and give today liter liberally and faithfully in spite of what I see or hear. And Father God, we thank you for jobs, better jobs, raises, and bonuses. We thank you for the favor of God being upon our people's lives. In Jesus' precious name, that you are opening new doors, you are repositioning some, Lord, and you know exactly where you need them to be and what you want them to do. So we seal off this prayer time with your precious blood, and we give you glory and honor. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm so glad to hear you behind all of that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah, and it's good to see you. Um, it's Pastor Appreciation Month, and um, we're excited about uh, our little soiree after church. Um, Katie and Dave, thanks for setting it up and all the helpers with that. But we would love to honor our pastors this morning, too. Um, so we're going to honor our pastors. VFF has... Uh, BFF has a, like I said last week, what an awesome church we have here. Everybody is just so generous and kind. And, you know, we have not really been hit with the COVID hurdle as far as finances go for our church. Um, we put parking lot lights out last yeah, week. Yeah. We got the, the places lit up. Uh, and yes, and the portico lights also, you know, and we had a team that, yeah, just these two guys that came here and they were so diligent and they were nice and they were easy. And, you know, so it's, again, just to be able to pay that bill and get that taken care of, it's like, this is that year. We, you don't know how, how it's going to work out, but pastors, we want to bless you as well. And we have a check in this card, um, Mary Lou written legible card. Because <laughs> if it were me, it would be like, dear pastors, and it's like, I need an interpretation of tongues here, you know? <laughs> anyway, um, we want to bless you. There's a check here for $2,000 to bless them. And thank you all for that as well. And our wonderful pastors. And let's just Let's just pray over them. I don't want to take up a lot of time right now, but this is important. This is our family. These are our shepherds that need to look out for us and, you know, look out in front of us, look out behind us and on the sides of us. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord, for our pastors, Mike and Debbie. Lord, I thank you for the calling that you have placed on their life because who would know going into a journey like this what, what you could possibly foresee in the front Father, I thank you that even through their hurdles, Lord, you have shown yourself mighty to them and to your glory, Lord. We have healthy pastors that, that continue to shepherd our, shirt, our church, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for, um, for clear vision going forward, Lord. And we thank you for your strength and your peace. And yes, your power and your might and even your joy, Lord. May it rest upon them even while they sleep with ideas and 
uh, new things to come to light, Lord. I thank you for that. I thank you, Father, that you open the doors that no man can open for them to walk through. And I thank you, Lord, that you shut doors that no man can open. To shut doors, Lord, for protection and um, just for receiving from you, Lord, all that you want us to receive, all that you want our pastors to receive, Lord. Really the strength and refreshment, the rejuvenation. We may or may not be in your last chapter. You know, you, are, you have a journey in front of you still to tend to your flock with. It's still there. You're not going to go out with a dim flame. That's not going to happen. It's going to be bright. You know, it's just like how the runners run in those uh, Olympic races. When they know they're last, you know, they still run with all of their might, you know, to the finish line. And this is what I see for both of you as well, running with all your might to your finish line. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, good morning, everybody. <laughs> so we have a, bit, a real short video to show, and then I'm going to talk for just a minute. Thanks. And now it's time for How to Pack a Shoebox with Bob and Larry, the part of the show where Bob and Larry come out and pack a shoebox. Howdy, kids. I'm Larry the Cucumber. And I'm Bob the Tomato. And we're here to tell you about Operation Christmas Child and how you can pack a shoebox full of gifts that'll go to a child in another country. It's a great way to remind them that they're special and loved by God and about the real meaning of Christmas, the birth of Jesus. Oh, let's get started. Nice ball. I love these. I've got tons of them. <laughs> Little help? Sure. I put together something I think I'll help. Roll film, Cordy. I meant with the ball. The first thing you'll need to pack a shoebox for Operation Christmas Child is a shoebox. What can I say? I like to collect shoeboxes. Decide if you want your gift to go to a boy or a girl ages 2 to 4, 5 to 9, or 10 to 14. Have an adult help you go to SamaritansPurse.org slash VeggieTales. You can print your label from here and check the box you want. Then, tape the label to the box. Now comes the fun part. You can add toys, school supplies, maybe even a French pea. Great! I did not have my passport! <laughs> okay, then maybe a toothbrush. Be sure to send only toys that are new and unused. And remember, don't send any kind of food items. Plus, no toy guns or war toys. But you can send a picture and a note. When you're done, bring your shoebox to the nearest Operation Christmas Child drop-off location. You can even build your box online. SamaritansPurse.org slash VeggieTales has all the info. Whether you pack your box yourself or build it online, you can follow your box online to find out which country it goes to. It's a really great way to show a child they're special in love. Uh, nice job, Larry. Thanks, Bob. Here, let me give you a hand with that. <laughs> yeah! Wow, that's one heavy baseball. You sure it's not too heavy for the kids? Bob? <laughs> this has been How to Pack a Shoebox with Bob and Larry. Tune in next time to hear Larry say... Bob, talk to me, man. <laughs> Pastor Mike, that was for you and for Mikey and for everybody else that loves Veggie Tales. So, um, so as you saw on the screen, there are little um, slips that you can that you can fill out and you can scan it and or enter the code on um, line and you can actually follow your box and you can find out where your box goes, which country it doesn't say which child, but it does tell you which country they go to. So that's really cool. Um, they are on the table in the back. If you would like to pick one of those up um, in the foyer. Um, so we have total so far 55 boxes, which is a good start. We still have a lot to go, uh, 345 to go, so to meet our goal. Um, there's 39 online boxes packed, and Katie made a nice little sign to keep track of how many we have online, so that's a nice visual for everybody to see. And then also we have, I think there's 16 there. So if you guys pack your boxes, bring them in, put them on the table there, and everybody can see how many we have. So that's a really good way to keep track of 
how we're doing. So um, if you have any questions, let me know. There are forms out on the table that tell you um, what are suggestions on what you can actually put in the boxes and just ideas for each age group and for girls and boys. So um, I think that's it. Thanks. All right, children, you can be dismissed to go to junior church. <clears throat> um, two really important announcements. Um, we were scheduled to have uh, Charlie and Sharon Sweet with us next weekend, and uh, he could not travel due to uh, a condition, a heart condition that he has. The doctors told him not to. And uh, I, I was disappointed, but then he said that the, he's been doing some virtual things. And I know that, you know, we kind of get, some of us are, have virtual fatigue when it comes to Zoom and stuff like that. But I just really felt in my heart that um, it would just be good to uh, have him minister to our congregation and and so we're going to be doing that. Uh, the youth will be ministered to. It'll be a Zoom type thing on Friday night at 7. Leaders at 9 a.m. That means you don't have to come here. Just put something on from the top, waist up, you know, and get in front of your, your camera or video at 9 a.m. on Saturday. And then he's going to be doing, uh, Mike Bustler and I are working on trying to figure out how to uh, do a virtual service on Sunday morning where we'll have regular worship but then he'll be able to minister virtually to us and we believe even do some prophetic ministry that morning. So it'll be really interesting. Uh, pray for our knowledge of that kind of thing. But, um, uh, you know, I talked to him. We were uh, want to try to meet with him when we we're down there because he's about an hour and a half from uh, where her mom lives. But um, it, we ended, it ended up not working out because he ended up with some uh, a bridge problem. And so anyway, um, but he's very excited about ministering. He's been doing some of these ministry uh, type things, and it's been very effective. And, and so um, I'm just looking forward to that. So that'll be next weekend. I'll be giving you emails so you'll know uh, when to tune in. So, but next Sunday here at church, Sunday morning. Everybody got that? Yeah. And then uh, the following Sunday, Andrew and Ann Taylor will be with us in person, live, uh, that Sunday morning. So... Um, we're looking forward to seeing them as well. All right, you ready for the word this morning? I got in last night at 9.30, pulled into the house, and I was going to go over my notes, and I thought, I'm tired. So I got up early this morning, and so hopefully we'll be doing good here. Father, thank you for your presence. We want your kingdom to come, not only in this earth, but in us. So God, I just thank you that as we pay attention to your word this morning, that our hearts are open to receive from you and that you're going to speak directly to each one of us. Take what I've put here, which I believe is inspired by you, but Holy Spirit, just take it and, um, and use it to minister life to each one of us. God, we, when we're exposed to the word of God, our, our, our heart is not just to read something or hear something, but we want to hear and read so that what we hear and read changes our life, Lord, because we want to be more like you. So we give this time to you in Jesus' name, and we all say, amen. amen. We're going to be looking at 2 Peter chapter 1. Um, I had shared with you a couple of weeks ago, um, and we were looking at glory and virtue, and I, I had a sermon prepared, and then the Lord kind of changed the direction of that, and we start talking about the sound of his glory. So this morning, I, I'm just going to share with you what I felt like the Lord had given me that week, and I, I believe it's for this morning. But we're looking at 2 Peter chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So we, we looked at the words grace and peace. Grace is divine favor and ability, and peace is perfect well-being, all necessary good, all spiritual prosperity, and freedom from fears and agitating passions and moral conflicts. 
A, a deeper meaning of the word peace is being intertwined with God. I, I just love that, that, that definition. Grace and peace comes through the knowledge of God, and the knowledge of God is it, it's personal. It's not just head knowledge. It's not just something we read, but it's, it's something that we learn by experience. So it's knowledge of God and knowing the Lord in an intimate way. Verse 3, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So his divine power has given us how many things? All things that pertain to life and godliness, and that comes through getting to know God. And he's given us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these promises we would be partakers of the divine nature. It is understanding who we are in Christ so that we don't live lives that are subject to who we were before we came to know God. You are a new cre creation, so you don't live by the old creation dictates. Are you with me? So Peter says that God has called us by his glory and virtue. Glory is the manifest presence of God. It's the miraculous working power of God in our lives. Virtue is moral excellence, godly character. It's the quality of the heart that brings realness to the message that we preach. Several translations translate the word virtue as excellence. Other translate it as goodness. So we could consider the glory of God, we looked at this, we could consider the glory of God as the gifts of the Spirit, you know, because they're, they're the power gifts. And we, we, we see the virtue, as God, uh, virtue of God as being the fruit of the Spirit or the character of God. So glory and virtue means that we are called not only to walk in the power of God, but walk in the character of God. And both of those work together. You know, uh, a lot of times we, we strive after gifts because we want, you know, I, I don't think it's a selfish thing. So we want to bless people. We want to see people heal. We want to see people set free. But uh, really, we, we also need the character of God because it's the character of God that's going to give longevity to our ministry. Many of us probably have known uh, ministers who have had tremendous gifts on their life when it comes to the power gifts and seeing people saved and healed, but then you see that they have a moral failure, and that really just destroys the ministry. And, and, and kind of, you know, so, so we need both of those things working together. And I'm thankful that God doesn't make us choose between the two. He wants us to walk in both of those. Now, let's look at verse 5. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. So Peter says that we are to give all diligence. How much diligence? That means, I love the definition of this, that means every ounce of energy straining every nerve. So in other words, this process is not something that happens through osmosis. It's not just something that we can be lazy about. It's not something that we can read a verse and say, okay, I, I read a verse and that's it. But it's something that we have to give all diligence to. We have to be purposeful in growing in these things. The challenge that we face is that gifts are given, but fruit is grown. Fruit doesn't just happen. There's labor involved. Yes, we do grow in the gifts by developing our sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, but they are still empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's His power, not ours, but developing in virtue is hard work. Amen. It's something that we got to give ourselves to. And then it says, add to, which means supply abundantly, generously provide. So what do we add to? What do we, we begin with? The first thing we begin with is faith. Faith is belief, moral conviction. And, and I believe that the first characteristic of the growing Christian is unique in that the Christian himself is not told to supply faith. But according to Peter first, uh, verse 1, 
faith is given. He declares that in his epistle that the readers have received a faith the same as ours. So faith is something we've received, not something we are to supply because faith is a gift from God. Romans chapter 12 verse 3 says, For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So God has given to each one of us faith. The faith begins as saving faith, and it allows us to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But we are to develop our faith. God gives us our faith, but we are to develop it. And developing our faith happens as we get into the Word of God, as we begin to apply the Word of God to our life, and as we, and we become stronger, our faith becomes stronger as we exercise it. How do we exercise faith? Well, you know, before you believe for healing for cancer, start with a toothache or a headache or something like that. You begin to use your faith. Before you believe God for $50,000 to pay off your house, believe God for, you know, a dollar so you can buy a Diet Coke or something, you know. Start somewhere with your faith. Begin to believe God. When our kids were small, they would come up and say, Dad, Mom, we want this. And we'd say, all right, use your faith for it. And that's not what they wanted to hear. But we taught them how to use their faith, and they would begin to pray and ask God for it because, and, and then right away you can determine, is this really a, a, a really a need, or is it just a passing fad or a want? Because when you begin to use your faith for something, if it's not a real need, you're not going to stick with it for very long. But if it's something that you really want, it's a, it's a desire of your heart, it's something that you need, you're going to apply your faith to it. And so we taught them to use their faith, exercise their faith. And so they did. And, and it was miraculously to see how God would work to bring what they wanted into their life. It was cool. So we are to develop our faith. Jesus himself is the object and the source of our faith. He is also the model of our faith. Jesus himself had to use faith when he submitted to the will of the Father by taking on human flesh and suffering and dying at the hands of sinful men. So we start with the measure of faith given to us by God. Now, I believe it's interesting and significant that Peter says that we are to add knowledge to virtue, not virtue to knowledge. You would think that we would need knowledge to understand virtue. You know, start with faith and then start learning spiritual things, all right? The problem is, is that our knowledge must be based on something because what we build our knowledge on will determine our whole belief system. We defined virtue as moral excellence. Really, it's the character of God, but it's a little bit deeper. Probably one of the most popular verses is in 1 Peter is verse 9 of chapter 2, which says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We've all heard that. Uh, the word praises, though, is the same Greek word for virtue. So we are to proclaim the virtues of him who called us out of darkness. The Amplified Bible says it this way. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a dedicated nation, God's own purchased special people, that you may set forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues and perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So our biblical knowledge has to be based on who God is, his virtues, his goodness, his perfections, his excellencies. Everything must begin with knowing who God is because without that foundation, it's easy to build on a false foundation. We add, listen, we add knowledge to our new creation reality. We're not using knowledge to try to become something. If we do that, we end up being self-righteous. No, we're, we're learning about who we already are because of Christ. Does that make sense? With a false foundation, the focus is always us. It can become about what we do instead of why we do it. The wrong foundation turns relationship into religion. It turns freedom into legalism. It turns unconditional love into conditional love. It becomes works instead of faith. It moves us from experiencing sonship to striving after self-work. 
So spiritual knowledge without the character of God can sometimes be used as a weapon instead of something that edifies. Adding virtue to our faith produces a mindset receptive to the knowledge of God revealed through the scriptures. If God is, uh, it's God is supreme, good, perfect, if that's not the foundation, then any knowledge we gain will always be filtered through the earthly mindset and will be easy to allow humanistic beliefs and even culture to distort our knowledge. So that's why knowledge has to be built on virtue, not the other way around. I, I love Romans 12 too. I shared this with you a couple of weeks ago in the message. And it says, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out, readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. So the foundation of the virtue of God will keep lifting us up. It's not going to pull us down. So next to virtue, we add knowledge. Now this is doctrinal knowledge. It's a knowledge revealed in Scripture with clear biblical support. It's also an experiential knowledge of God. This experience is not divorced from Scripture. Rather, it is the experiencing of Scripture. So the writer of, the he of Hebrews put it this way in, in chapter 5. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. So this knowledge is not only head knowledge, but it's knowledge gained by putting the word of God to work in our life. So it means that we are not just learning about God, but we are actually getting to know God. We're not just reading about God, but we're experiencing God. We're not just getting into the word, but the word is getting into us. Does that make sense? Next, we add self-control. Theologian William Barclay informs us that the term rendered self-control means literally to take a grip of oneself. Right? Self-control is the opposite of self-indulgence. As unbelievers, we are dominated by our physical appetites. Whatever we want to do, we do it. But we are enslaved to them. But in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 says... And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Now, that's the way we used to be, but we've been delivered from our bondage to the flesh. So living a godly life requires us to master the flesh and make it our servant rather than our master. So listen, you do not have to sin. That's right. It is not your nature to sin. When you accept Jesus Christ into your heart, it is no longer your nature to sin. So you don't have to do it. You're no longer a sinner. You're a child of God. You can control yourself. Yes. You can. The devil can't make you do anything. Come on. You are not a slave to any whim, urge, or desire that pr presents itself to you. You're not. Through the knowledge of the word that is built on the character and excellencies of God, we learn who we are and whose we are. And through that knowledge, we add self-control so that we act like and we live like who we really are, not who we were. So the devil cannot make you do anything. Everything we do, both good and bad, everything that we say, both good and bad, every response to someone else, both good and bad, is a result of the choice that we make. You can control yourself. You really can. Is everybody with me? Yeah. To self-control, we add perseverance. Perseverance is endurance, constancy, patience. 
Perseverance enables us to persist in our pursuit of godly character, even when we suffer for doing so. You know, if self-control has to do with physical pleasures, perseverance has to do with pain. And the pain that I'm talking about is the pain that comes from facing the opposition of the enemy. You know, when you make a stand for righteousness, when you make a stand as a Christian, you're, there's going to be people that are going to resist that. There are going to be people that are going to make fun of you, people that are going to talk about you. It doesn't take much of reading the newspaper that people think that Christians are bigots, narrow-minded. And, and I really believe that we're in the beginning of the persecution of the church. And we're seeing it happen all over the United States. Especially in, in states like California and New York and other states with, with Democratic governors that, that are just trying to shut down the church, trying to keep the church quiet. Don't sing. Don't go to church. You can do all this other stuff. You can protest outside like uh, what, however you want. Don't go to church. We're shutting the churches down. That's what we're facing with now. So it started. So perseverance is the frame of mind and character which persists in doing what is right, even though doing so may produce difficulties, sufferings, and sorrows. Perseverance is the commitment to suffer in the short term in order to experience glory for eternity. Perseverance was exemplified by our Lord in Hebrews chapter 12. It says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. So we can expect hostility from sinners. It's going to happen, so don't be overwhelmed by it. Don't become weary and discouraged. Perseverance also includes patience. That's probably a word that we understand more. Patience can be a bad word to us because we want things right away, don't we? But we have to have patience and not be in such a hurry. The other night we were in Florida and, and we were sitting at a dinner table with uh, Todd and Sharon's son and daughter-in-law and their little girl. Their little girl, Lily. I don't know how she old, old she is, but... Uh, it, the food hadn't come yet. And so she was getting impatient, as a toddler does. And so her mom starts singing to her, have patience, have patience, don't be in such a hurry. When you get impatient, you only start to worry. Remember, remember that God is patient too. And think of all the times that others had to wait for you. That took Debbie and I back 40 years because that was by Candle. It was that group, a Christian group called Candle, and they put out these kids' albums, and that was off of the album called Animals and Other Things, which was published in 1980. And we bought those, and, and we played them for our children all of the time. Have patience. Because they were teaching them the character of God. And so we're, we're sitting there, and we're, okay, do you know the beaver song? Busy, busy beaver. You know the Galapagos song? And, and the girls, uh, Caitlin's looking at us like, what? Haven't you heard those? She said, no, that's the only one my mom taught me. And so it kind of made us feel our age again. We thought we had a kindred soul here, but she only knew the one song. <laughs> but grab a hold of the promises of God and hold on until you persevere into victory. Persevering through the attacks of the enemy and the hostility of sinners. There is victory ahead. Have patience. Amen. Have patience. To perseverance, we add godliness. Now, godliness does speak of holiness. We looked at holiness a couple of weeks ago. But it means more than just being holy. It speaks of the outflow of our lives. It's interesting that the term Peter uses here for godliness is not used in the New Testament very often. And the reason why it's not used in the New Testament very often is because it was the same expression 
The same expression, it was the most common word for religion in the pagan culture of Peter's day. And so the writers typically didn't use that word because they didn't want what they were saying to be misconstrued. They didn't use that word because what the word meant could mean something to the people that, that associated with, you know, that saw what was happening in the pagan culture. So godliness refers to practical religion, or perhaps we should say practiced religion. Godliness is the religion we practice on our, in our day-to-day -day walk. Now, it's the attitude of reverence which seeks to please God in all things. It desires a right, right relationship with both God and men. And the reason why that, like I said, that word was not used very often was because often we do things just because we're supposed to as a law, if you understand what I mean. You know, there are dictates in the word of God, but there are also things like growing up, you know, in, in the churches that we grew up in, there were edicts and things that you've had to follow that weren't necessarily part of the word of God, but it was the dictates of what we had to do to be godly, considered godly, let's put it that way. So it was an appearance thing rather than a heart thing. Does that make sense? So godliness brings the sanctifying presence of God into all the experiences of life. Uh, the Old Testament law related true faith to the daily aspects of living, and the New Testament does the same. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 14, Jesus is speaking, and he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore, you will receive greater condemnation. So he's talking about you're praying a lot. Everybody sees you making prayers, but then you're also devouring widows' houses. Your actions aren't lining up with your words. Verse 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anus and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. So godliness is not just doing things like tithing. We should tithe. That's what Jesus was saying. Go ahead and tithe. That's part of being godly. But also, godliness is justice, mercy, and faith. So are you just doing something so that others see you doing it, or is your heart involved in what you're doing? Right. James chapter 1, verse 27 says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. It's doing what God would do if he saw a need. It means that we are not just living for ourselves, but we must have an other's focus. It means living a giving life. It's is practically walking out your faith in relationship to others. It is doing good things because of who we are, not doing good things to obtain favor or attention. You with me in that? To godliness, we add brotherly kindness. Brotherly kindness. In the Greek, it's Philadelphus. It's the love saints should have for one another as fellow believers. It is the, a love based on part of what we share in common and the one we love. So there, there's an element of giving and receiving in this word, brotherly kindness. It means that we're ministering to other people. Other people are ministering to us. It really is the love that we have for other Christians. We are in the brotherhood of the saints. It, it's based on a shared relationship. You know, and it's interesting that wherever I have been in the world, I can sense this kind of love. In Africa, in India, Indonesia, Fiji, Tajikistan, I am in the presence with other Christians, and there's this camaraderie, there's this love for one another. We never met. We don't know. I don't understand the, mostly their culture. They don't understand mine, but here we are, brothers in Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ, and there's this camaraderie that's there. We're family. That's this type of love. It doesn't mean that that brotherly love is automatic. If it were, Peter would not have found it necessary to command us to add it to our life. 1 Peter 1.22 says, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth of the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently, 
with a pure heart. So it's something that we have to purpose to do. It, it probably just doesn't come natural because, you know, our old man was selfish. And here we're told to give. So it's, it's a whole new way of living. And then the final attribute we add is love. Now, this love is agape love. It's the God kind of love. It's also the capstone of all the virtues that we should pursue. As I was studying this, I came across a quote from Michael Green, who is a Christian author, that shows the uniqueness of agape. Right? So here's what he said. In friendship, or philia, the partners seek mutual solace. In sexual love, which is eros, they seek mutual satisfaction. In both cases, these feelings are aroused because of what the loved one is. With agape, it is the reverse. God's agape is evoked not by what we are, but by what he is. It has its origin in the agent, not in the object. This agape must be defined as a deliberate desire for the highest good of the one loved, which shows itself in sacrificial action for that person's good. That is what God did for us. In John 3, 16, and I read that, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He continues, that is what he wants us to do. We find that in 1 John 3, 16. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. This is what he is prepared to achieve in us. Romans 5, 5. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Thus the Spirit of God, who is love, is freely given to us in order to reproduce in us that same quality. So that's what God is placing inside of us. That's the capstone. That's the ultimate of all of these things that we're adding is that we love people like God loved people. And still loves people. And we have to have that kind of love. It's not a love just for other believers who are easy to love, but it's for, it's for unbelievers. 1 Thessalonians 3.12 says, And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all men, just as we also do for you. Agape love is not prompted by what other people is or does, but by a love rooted in what God is. It is the love of God which flows through us. So, we have all of these virtues that I just talked about. I want us to remember again that we all are to give all diligence to see that these virtues are in our life. They are not automatic. They take work. They just don't happen. Christian growth takes time, but it can happen, and it should happen in our life. Now, if we don't give attention to it, listen, if we are not growing in the things of God, then we're, we're not just standing still we're actually going backwards. Because if you are not purposely pursuing going forward, you're gonna go backwards. And you can lose what you already have. That happened in the church in Ephesus. What happened in, in Revelations? It says they lost their first love. Now, there's work that has to be done in growing, but here's the good news. There is an incredible promise here for those of us that will be diligent in this area. So after he lists out all of these things, we come to verse 8. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren... Be even more diligent to make your call and election sh sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an, endurance, an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I mean, did you see those promises? I think that's awesome. You will not be barren. You will not be unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you will never stumble. Wow. Your life will be fruitful. You will get to know more about and experience more of the fullness of God. And you will never stumble.
Heeding these words, applying ourselves to this, keeps us from being useless and unfruitful in our relationship with Jesus Christ. If we don't, as Peter instruction, our perception and confidence in the salvation God has provided us is diminished and sets us up for a fall. But if we apply ourselves to these things, then we're going to be fruitful. We're going to know God like never before, and we're not going to stumble. Isn't that good news? That is the spiritual growth equation. Let's stand. God, we thank you for the promises in the Word of God. We thank you for your heart for us that you want us to be successful. And not only do you want us to be successful and fruitful, but you give us the means in how to do that. And so God, as we look at this spiritual growth equation, I just thank you that these are not commands that you are giving us that we cannot fully enter into, that are beyond us. But because they're instructed and we're admonished to do this, the Holy Spirit is inside of us to help us to do this. And so, God, we just are so grateful for the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. That encourages us, that helps us. He's our helper. He's our teacher. But I also pray, God, that you will help each one of us to give ourselves to this, to give all diligence to add these things to our life. And then I thank you that as we do, we're going to walk in the fulfillment of the promise that you have spoken in your word. And so we thank you for that, in Jesus' name. And if you're in agreement with that, we say amen.